Okay, so I met Phil Tattersall. Uh, he was visiting England. He's an independent scientist who's been doing critical environmental work for many years, uh, created a technique he called community-based audit. Uh, you can Google on it and find it, which is essentially post-normal science in action. Uh, and we had one of our great talks and came up with this idea of the science of bads. And I want to just uh, talk about that briefly today. Uh, how do I? OK. No. OK. Uh, I'm just giving you, how do I? OK. Sure. We're not talking about intended bads. We're talking about the science intended to enable us to cope with the bad things, processes, and events that are agreed as unwanted. Pollution, all that sort of stuff. Now, the th my thesis is this is a very different sort of science from the science of goods, and it is the sort of science that's involved in science advice. OK. Now, for a long time, it was believed uh, that the bads could be conquered by the same approach as science for goods. We needed a magic bullet that would kill the germs, the bugs, the weeds, or whatever. Uh, and of course, we do the research, we make the magic bullet, kill the germs, and everybody's happy. Uh, we now know it just doesn't work. So the scientist was, as I say, a bespectacled white man in a lab coat holding a test tube up to the light and realizing he'd found the cure for cancer. Uh, and of course, we know that doesn't work so well. This was the philosophy of stamping out evils, having a war on whatever. Uh, and then, of course, things began to change. The world is complex. And if global warming doesn't get us, then superbug, junk food diabetes, or genotoxic pollutants might. So uh, where do we go now? We need a new paradigm, how to do science in the case of bads. In the simple traditional science of goods, and here's my three-minute lecture, we assume situations are simple. They have few variables. They're controllable by predictable reactions, and they're reproducible by researchers anywhere. Now, the uncertainties must and can be tamed, <laughs> reduced to random effects and described mathematically. Every problem has just one correct answer. None, I mean, a real problem will be soluble, and there's one right answer against all the wrong ones, as in a textbook. And finally, research is an exploration into the unknown. So ignorance is there, but it's there to be conquered bit by bit. And let's just say uh, this is the philosophy which has been so extraordinarily successful in creating the material and environmental situation whereby we come here, we fly in, we are safe, we have all this gear here, so I don't run down traditional science or the science of goods. But now, of course, the bads are crowding in. There is a clear definition of ends and means. Consequences, even when intended, are not problematic, are assumed good. Uh, research is innocent. Science advice is speaking truth to power. And uh, although there will always be those with intellectual property at risk, the world welcomes discoverers. And this is the normal situation. OK. Now, here we come to bads. And this is most important. Uncovering a suspected ongoing evil. It starts with phenomena that may be indistinct and confused whose causality is uncertain. And as Bruno was quoting as like, Love Canal was the classic here. Kids were getting sick. Nobody knew why. Uh, the doctors sort of said, well, they have flu. Uh, and as we've seen, oh, OK, now. The puzzle solving with simple evidence and argument is inadequate. You take some samples and send them back to the lab. And, and actually, typically, the great paradox of pollution control, so you and I worked on this ages ago, is if you have chronic effects from low doses out there, you test them 
with immediate effects from high doses on your rats or your guinea pigs or whatever, and there is a mismatch. So if you want to see what is going on out there, simple lab rats or math models are not useless, inadequate. Then, most important, effective research may need skills of history, whistleblowing, investigative journalism, and campaigning. Because I'm not sure it's in this text, no. And that is because, the other principle, if a situation it persists, it's because someone benefits from its persistence. In Flint, Michigan, you had a state environmental agency. They didn't need to have a water pollution scandal. They were already underfinanced and understaffed. The last thing they need is trouble. <coughs> and so when people say, hey, you know, my pipes are corroding or whatever, well, it's anecdotal, anecdotal. And so that's why you need what from a traditional science of goods point of view can be unorthodox or even dirty tricks are essential in the science of bads. Then, just to make things more difficult, the science of bads are the generally the low prestige soft sciences of effects. Ecotoxicology, as you know, uh, environmental pollution that generally are there to clean up the harm that is done by the high prestige, hard lab-based technologies. So, you know, we have all these wonderful processes. Oh, well, then there are the externalities, uh, which, of course, as we say, are low prestige and soft. Uh, as Sidney Brenner once said, there's no Nobel Prize for safety. Uh, but then we do have unintended consequences, or Murphy's Law. So then the thing is, then I ask, where does a science course tell students about things going wrong? And in fact, we mentioned teachers that came to my mind that traditionally the most successful science teachers are those whose lab demonstrations always go wrong and the kids all laugh. And they remember, poor old Smithers, everything went wrong, but you know, I learned a lot, you see. And they don't connect the two. Okay. Okay, now, um, the problems may, the researchers may lack legitimacy. Uh, they may not have access to the infrastructure. At Flint, Michigan, they found an academic scientist who supported them, and he was in West Virginia because he was the one environmental scientist who was prepared to harm his career and his school by looking at all these uncomfortable problems. That's right. The official response may be the research must be, have quality. And I use quality now as a verb uh, to be evaluated with a pass mark of 120%. The researcher can also be victimized. Uh, I, cases here, Chapella at UCB, and then there will always be good scientists who say, no, this research is inadequate, and others keep shut. And of course, then you have the extended peer community, and suddenly realized this morning the difference between extended peer community and extended peer review, because the review is a process, the community is, a, is people. And right from the very beginning, as Silvio knows so well, various friends uh, were less uncomfortable with extended peer review. And you can check the literature. There's a whole stream there of people talked about review and not community. And you suddenly realize why. OK. Uh, the community, as Kuhn says, will suppress novelties, etc. Uh, and if you just look to the end, the Stalinist methods used to man manage the bads of BSC are a classic case of policy-based evidence. BSC was mad cow disease, and its mismanagement throughout by the British science bureaucracy is a classic. Okay, now I don't want that. Um, then, of course, we did have anybody here from the Environment Agency, uh, thanks largely to David G. Uh, and then Jackie McClade giving her support. There was the classic late lessons from early warnings where they had all these case studies and as, as the best one of all of asbestos, which took merely a hundred years uh, to be banned after its dangers were known. Then finally, how am I doing, Martin? Oh, great. <laughs> you have 12 seconds. 
Okay, read Phil, Phil Tattersall's story of how a teenager discovered science uh, the instructive way. Uh, he found pollution, and all of a sudden, he was no longer a nice teenager doing research. He was a bad thing, and they dumped on him. Uh, and that is the uh, paradigm case of science and fads. Okay, that's it. Um, fine. <laughs> <laughs>